in this video I'll be introducing natural transformations. Now what a natural transformation is, is it's like a transformation between two functors. What it does is it allows us to transition between the functor applied to objects to the other functor applied to the object, and it allows us to transition between the functor applied to the arrow and the other functor applied to the arrow. Let me show you what I mean. So the first thing we need for a natural transformation are two functors f and g, both of which are from a category c into a category d. Then a natural transformation will be written like this. Tau is usually the name we give it, and it will be written colon f, a little arrow with a dot above it so you know it's not a functor. We have so many arrows that this just makes it easier to distinguish into g. So this is a natural transformation from f to g. So the first thing I said you needed to be able to do is transition between the functors applied to the object. So what I'll do is I'll define for every single object c of the category c, we define a morphism tau sub c, that's subscript. And it is a morphism from f of c to g of c. So this morphism is the transition between the functors applied to the objects. So that's the first condition. Now we need to do the same for the arrows. So for every arrow, f from a to b. Well, let's write out what we know so far. So we have f of a and g of a. How can I connect them? I can connect them with tau a. That's just from this first part. And then I can have f of b, and I can have g of b. And I can connect them with tau b. Now I can transition from f of a to f of b pretty easily. Look at this morphism, it's from A to B. So I could just do F applied to that morphism. And then same thing down here, I could just do G applied to the morphism, to transition. And look at that, we have this nice diagram constructed only using the stuff that we know. And so we better hope that this commutes. So if this is a commutative diagram, then this is a natural transformation. What this really is saying is that we do tau a first, so tau a first, and then we do g of f. So g of f compose tau a. This has to be equal to f of f and then tau b, like that. So if you change the functor, then you switch and change the object. This is the transition between the functors applied to the objects, and this diagram is the transition between the functors applied to the arrows. Look at that. F of F, G of F. Natural transformations are really transformations on the images of these functors, in both the arrows and the objects. Let's do an example. How about we do it on sets? That's an easy category. Well, we have the power set functor from last time. We also have the identity functor. And these are both from set to set. And set is the category of sets with the arrows, the functions. And we can create a natural transformation, tau, between the identity functor, with a little dot over it because it's a natural transformation, and the power set functor. What do we need for this? Well, first of all, we need these components. So these are the component morphisms. So C here is an object of C, and both of these come from set. So for every single object of the set category, which is just a set, so tau sub some set x is going to have to be from the identity functor applied to a set, is just the set itself, into the power set applied to a set, which is the power set of the set. So this is a function from x to the power set of x. So tau x applied to some element x of x, and then what I'll do is I'll create the set of x. That is in fact a subset of x, so it's in the power set 
of x. Now we have to transition between arrows. So four arrows from, let's say, x to y. What's the diagram? Well, the diagram looks like this. f here is the identity. So the identity applied to x is x. The identity applied to f is f. The identity applied to y is y. Then we bring it down via tau x to well, now we need to do the power set applied to the set. So this is the power set on x. Then we go down via tau y to the other functor, the power set on y. And then we go across via the power set on f. All right, now we must look at this commutative diagram. So let's see if it commutes. So let's follow the two paths. We do tau x. And then we do power set on f. We compose them. And this has to be equal to, we do f first, and then we do tau y. Because both of these are just functions, we can just apply them to a general element. So the power set on f, compose tau x, apply to some x. Well, this is going to be equal to the power set on f applied to tau x applied to x. And by the definition that we gave it, it's just the set of x. So let's just write that in. Now, by the definition of the power set applied to the function, it's just the image of whatever the set is in here. So this is equal to the set of f of x. Because there's only one element in the set, we just apply f to that, and that's the image. All right, so that was that side. Now let's do this side. So we do tau y composed f, and we apply that to the same x element. This is equal to tau y applied to just f of x, because f is a general morphism. Now tau y is the set of whatever's in it. So this is equal to the set of f of x. Well, look at that. We came out with the same result. And so this equality is true because it's true for each individual x. And so we have a natural transformation between the power set functor and the identity functor. All right, let's do a little bit more involved of an example. What we're going to do is define a new functor. I'll call it star. It'll be from the commutative rings into the groups. What it'll do is it'll send each commutative ring k, and it'll send it to k star, the set of units. So this is the set of a, an element of k, such that it has an inverse. The units of a ring are the elements which have a multiplicative inverse. And so this creates a group under multiplication. And then we have to define this for morphisms. So f from one k to another k, k prime. And we send this to the new morphism. I'll call it f star, which takes in a unit from k, sends it out to a unit from k prime. What it does is it sends some unit in k, and it sends it to f of k. So really, it's just the restriction to the units. Now, we also have the general linear group, which I described last time, from the commutative rings to the group category. All right, now we can create a natural transformation from the general linear group to this star operator. I have to write a little dot. What we do is we define tau at some ring k is just going to be the determinant on k, which is a map from the general linear group on k to k star, the set of units. Now, why is that? So the general linear group on k is the set of invertible matrices. k star is the set of units. How do I know that the determinant sends these matrices to units? Remember back to the real numbers and their general linear group. The determinant of a matrix 
tells you whether it's invertible or not. If the determinant of a matrix is not zero on the real numbers, then it's invertible. But if it is zero, it's not invertible. Well, this is the same exact idea because think about it. What are the units of R? We can basically do everything in R, except the thing we have to include is that it can't be zero. Because if it's zero, we have one over zero, which doesn't exist. When the determinant of A is not zero, by this fact, it's a unit. So when the determinant of A is a unit, then you can have an inverse, which is what this is saying. Now, how do I know that the determinant is actually a natural transformation between these two functors? Well, there's only one way to find out. We have a homomorphism from k to k prime. Both of these are rings, and the diagram that comes with this will look like this. We have the general linear group on k, and we send it down to k star via the map tau k. And then we have the general linear group on k prime, and we send it down via tau k prime to k prime star. And then the thing we can do is transition between these two using gln on f, and then we transition between these two using f star, which is just the restriction of f. Now, we have to prove that this diagram commutes. I'm gonna leave it to you. You might think that I'm just avoiding it, but I'm actually not. It's just, it'll take too long and I want to get to more stuff. So the hint I'll give you is that the determinant on some ring of a matrix where we have f of a11 to f of a n1, f of a1 n, f of a n n, if we have that matrix, and f right here is a ring homomorphism, what you can do is you can move the f outside. So you get f applied to the determinant on k applied to that same exact matrix. When you have a linear function, you can move it outside of the determinant. That's a theorem that you will use to prove that this diagram commutes. And I also want you to get some practice proving that diagrams commute. So put your answers in the comments. Now, you might be wondering, uh, can we compose natural transformations? And the answer is yes. Let's define it. All right, how do we compose natural transformations? I'm keeping this definition here just so you can remember it. So if I have a natural transformation tau, which is from f to g, and I have tau prime from g to h. Now note that f, g, and h are all functors from c to d. How do we define tau prime composed tau? And we usually don't write an open circle, we write a little filled in circle, like a dot multiplication. Now the reason why is we want to distinguish from functor composition, natural transformation composition, and arrow composition. And so we just use different notation for each one of them. So now tau prime composed tau, what are the things we need to define first? Well, the first thing we need to define is the components, because these are the things that we actually need to use. So let's define it for some component C. It's gonna be pretty easy, and you're gonna see how easy it is. It's tau prime C composed tau C. Because let's think about this. Tau C is a map from f of C to g of C, right from the definition. And tau prime on C is a map from g of C to h of C. And so that composition makes perfect sense. But once I draw the diagram, you'll see how much more sense it'll make. But let's draw the diagram. So we start off with f of a. And instead of going down directly to h of a, I'm going to take the long way around. I'm going to go to g of a via tau a. I'm going to move it across via f of f to f of b. I'm going to move that down to g of b using tau b. 
I'm going to move it across using g of f. This is the diagram used by this first natural transformation. So, because it's a natural transformation, it commutes. Now, notice that we have this g a and g of b. Well, now we can move down from g of a and g of b via tau a prime and tau b prime to h of a and h of b. And I can move it across via h of f. So you can see we now have the diagram of tau prime right there. So this part of it also commutes. Now I just have to prove that everything here commutes. So f of a goes down to h of a via that, and then we move across via h of f. Then I have to have that equal to f of f moves down to h of b. Let's do out both of those morphisms. So I have tau a, I have tau a prime, and then I have h of f. And now we're going to compare this with the one going across and then down like that, which is tau b prime composed tau b composed f of f. How do we compare these two? Well, first of all, I'm going to take this right here. I'm going to section it off into that. Now, tau b composed f of f, guess what that is? f of f, tau b, ah, we can switch that out there. So this is equal to tau b prime composed. We switch it out with this part because this part commutes. It's the this diagram. Then we get g of f composed tau a. So I just switched it out there. Now let's remove the parentheses and move the parentheses back there by associativity. So tau b prime, g of f is right here. So g of f tau b prime is the same as that right there. So this is equal to h of f composed tau a prime, then composed tau a. Oh, remove the parentheses. Guess what we have? We have it. Now, you could have just used the theorem that because both of these boxes commute that the entire thing must commute, but I just proved that. So now that I know that this entire thing commutes, what I can do is actually remove some of the information we have. I'm going to remove this entire middle section. So if I get rid of all that information, what's left? So I have tau a prime tau a, then I have to compose two of those. Uh, tau a, tau a prime. That's that map right there. And then tau b and tau b prime have to combine into their composition. And now this diagram still commutes by the fact that the previous diagram commutes and we just removed information. Now look at this. Tau b prime composed tau b. It's right there. It's from the definition of the composition. And this diagram is actually the diagram of this composition. So this diagram commutes, meaning that this is a natural transformation. Oh my god. We have composition of natural transformations. You can probably see what we're going to do by the fact that we have composition and that they look like arrows. We're going to create a new category using natural transformations. Specifically, if we take the functor category between two categories, now this is what I'll call it, the objects are functors, f from c to d, and the arrows are natural transformations, tau, from two functors, f to g. So the objects are the functors, the arrows are the natural transformations. This creates a new category for the functors on a category. Please note that there are also identity transformations. So the identity transformation on a functor f from f to f is where tau c from f of c to f of c is just going to be the identity on f of c, which alternatively is just f on the identity. And then you can easily prove that that is a natural transformation. It's trivial. Isn't that absolutely ridiculous? Listen 
to what happened. Listen to the structure that we've added up so far. We created these transformations between categories. And then we created transformations between those transformations. And then using those transformations between those transformations, we created a new category. And then on this new category, we can create new transformations, new functors between this category and itself, right? And so we can keep building up with transformations on top of transformations. And when we get to comma categories, what you will see is that a natural transformation is just a functor using a comma category. You'll see once we get to comma categories, natural transformations can just be viewed as functors. And so eventually we'll get natural transformations between natural transformations. And then once we have natural transformations between natural transformations, guess what? We can create a new category and then we can have functors, natural transformations, natural transformations between the natural transformations. And it's so self-referential. Everything that we do, there's going to be some way to connect it to the original category theory idea. In category theory, if you can't describe something in terms of objects and arrows, it's probably not important. Because even natural transformations are the arrows of a category. So nothing is safe in category theory. Everything is an arrow, everything is an object. No matter what you think, no matter where you turn, you will see arrows and objects everywhere in category theory even when talking about category theory. Category theory doesn't just describe every other theory, it also describes itself. And that's ridiculous. That's it.